Morning. Good morning. Good evening, everybody. I'm a little late. Yeah. Glad to have you with us, everybody. We thought we might get some visitors from the fair. We don't know. We still might. If you've been to the fair, I'm sure that might be on your agenda. That's, that's, that's kind of fun this time of year, isn't it? If you're with us online, thank you for joining us. We're going to have Mr. Wayne in just a minute get up here and, and give us some uh, lessons on First and Second Timothy. But before that happens, we're going to give you some announcements, and I'm going to talk about this tomato. Here's our announcements for tonight. Lloyd Schmidt will have a heart cath next Thursday. Neil Schmidtberger will have surgery next Friday. Please keep Lloyd and Neil in your prayers. On Tuesday, September 21st, Betty Hudson, a friend of Diane Dixon, is going to have throat surgery to remove a cyst. Please remember her in your prayers. Thank you. Please continue to keep Dickie Smith's brother, Pete Osborne, in your prayers as he is recovering from a successful brain surgery that took place on Tuesday. Our sincere sympathy goes to the family of Richard Keeler, who passed away Friday. There was a celebration of life gathering at the LH this afternoon. Congratulations to Jonathan and Kristen Schmucker. This is the announcement Michelle's been waiting on. On the birth of Keston Ray, he was born Monday, weighed seven pounds, nine ounces, and is 19 and three quarter inches long. Happy grandparents are Ken and Michelle. So they've been waiting on that. I think they came home today, right? I think. I think they were scheduled to come home today. Okay, good. All right. And then I have a couple more I have announcements here on that were just given to me. Uh, Carol Wirtz gave me this one. She said, Taylor, Bell, uh, Taylor Beals, daughter of Amanda and Scott Beal, granddaughter to Alan and Carol, have been diagnosed as di with uh, diabetes one, she is 13 years old. Now that's, not a, that's not fun to be diagnosed at that age, especially. 
And also, George Mary told me a while ago that he will have a replacement on his pacemaker on the 21st. And you will return. Thank you. We want you to return. That's good. That's good. Well, let's go to our Father in prayer then. Father, we thank you so much for listening to our prayers and our requests. And we just know that you, you like us to sp speak and to pray to you, and you will listen. You've told us you will. We thank you for calling us your children, and we have a one-on-one -on -one relationship because of that. We thank you, Father, for the uh, time we have together in fellowship and, and study this evening. We pray that all will go well and we can leave here realizing it was good to be here because we have picked up and learned something from this book. We thank you, Father, for your healing of the people that, have, that you've helped. And with the list of names I've just been given, I pray that you would help these people also. Thank you for forgiveness of sins. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that we be, are Christians and in that name Christ is in that word. And we're thankful to be part of that word when we're called Christians. Forgive us of our sins. Help us in this week to, to do our, our daily duties as you would have us to do and serve you the best way possible. In Jesus' name, amen. Now that's one of the last tomatoes out of my garden. They're just about shot. This is about a, medi about a mediocre size one that I've had this year. I've had littler ones, and I've had a lot of them that are bigger. <clears throat> I was trying to figure out how to weigh this thing. It looks to me like from what I could take it out of the cupboard and think about it, it won't even show up on the scales. So I, I went to the cupboard and got some things out. This looks to me like four to five ounces is what this tomato weighs. And what brought this up is because when we have our Tuesday morning coffee, there's about six of us that meet Tuesday morning over at Spangles at 6.30. I know you're not up by then, but that's when we meet. Okay, and we talk about silly things. And one of the silly things that we talked about is the Guinness's book of records of vegetables and fruits and things that show up at the fair when people take their stuff over there, okay? So I have about three items on here that I want to give you some information on, and one happens to be a tomato. If I was going to ask you what's the biggest tomato that, that you think is in the Guinness's book of records, what would you think it, it, it might weigh? Okay. Your guesses are not correct. I didn't even hear one. Okay. Four and a half pounds. Well, you're about halfway right. Seven pounds, 12 ounces is the largest tomato on Guinness's book of record. That's a big one, isn't it? And that's, and that's only four ounces? It didn't say how big around it was, just gave it the weight. Okay, how about a watermelon? Christopher Kent from Severville, Tennessee has the heaviest watermelon on the book of Guinness's records. In 2013, he weighed one at 351 pounds. Now that is a watermelon, isn't it? Okay, then I have one more. We were also talking about pumpkins. Sometimes we look at pumpkins over at the fair, and I know some of the people here, like the Allens, they grow pumpkins. Okay, Chris Stevens from New Richmond, Wisconsin, has in the Guinness Book of Record the largest pumpkin at 1,810 pounds. That is a pumpkin. That's almost a ton, isn't it? That's almost a ton. So you're saying, Steve, where are you going with this? Let me tell you where I'm going with this. I'm gonna go back over here to the book of Exodus. And if you recall, first of all, I'm gonna to go to the numbers, then I'm gonna turn back to Exodus for a minute. Because as you recall, when the children of Israel, after, after they got out of the promise, I mean, out of Egypt, they were to go into the land and search it out, the 12 spies, you all know that story, I know. So. Let's just read just a little bit of it here for a second. First, I want you to notice something in verses 2 of chapter 13 of Numbers. Send out for yourself men so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, and this is God speaking, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. Did you see that? He's going to give it to the sons of Israel. When somebody gives me something, that means that, hey man, it's a gift. I want it. I'm going to take it. It's a, it's a for sure thing. Okay. I want to come back over here to Exodus chapter 23 and read a couple of verses out of this. It goes along with the same kind of an idea. <clears throat> Verse 22 of chapter 23. But if you will truly, this is, this is God speaking to Moses, telling the people these things. But if you will truly obey his voice and do all that I say, 
then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perserites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will completely destroy them. Now that's the land these 12 spies are getting ready to go check it out. Now let's go over back to Numbers and see what happens here. In verse 17 of chapter 13, when Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, go up there into the Negev, then go up into the hill country, and then to the land, uh, the land that is like it, and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and how is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they open camps or are they fortifications? And how is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? Now, I want you to take note. When Moses sends these spies into the land to spy it out, it isn't because he doesn't know for sure if they can take the land. God has already told them they can take the land. Moses has faith this is going to happen. What Moses is doing is making a plan of action. So he wants to go in, check out the land. When the spies come back, he's going to make a plan of action from their report. It's not that they can't take the land. He's just going to make a plan so he can go about it in the best possible way. Now, there's a difference here between can we or can't we? No, he knows he can. But how are we going to go about it? Send these people in, and when they come back, we'll make a plan. That's what he's got in mind. Down to verse 23. Then they came, this is they coming back. Then they came back to the valley of Esco, and from there cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two men with some of the pomegranates and the figs. Now they're in the land, these spies, and they've seen all these vegetables and fruits and things that grow so big and so luxurious and just great. They've cut a couple branches of, of grapes down, and they got pomegranates and figs, and they're bringing them back to show the Israelite people and show Moses, this is what we found. Well, here's the problem. Verse 28, they come up with this little adverb here. Nevertheless, and then they start talking about all these other things they can't do, okay? The people who live in the land are strong and their cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Achanach there and Amalek is living in the land of the Negev and the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites live in the hill country and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Okay, at this point, Caleb has had enough. You know, Joshua and Caleb are the two spies that came back. At this point, Caleb's had a knife. He's going to speak out. He's going to speak up. Verse 30, then Caleb quoted the people from Moses, or quieted the people from Moses, I mean, and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we shall surely overcome it. But the men who gone up with him, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. Then you get over to chapter 14 and in verse 6, Joshua comes on board. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Janunah, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, This land which we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, and, and a, a land which flows with milk and honey. Now, the point I'm trying to make is this. The land was given to them, but they had to make a plan of action before they could take it, so let's see how they want to do it. You see the shirt I'm wearing? This is the shirt we had at camp this year. He is able, Philippians 4.13, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? The church that Jesus died for, which we are a part of, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We don't want to be pessimistic. We need to be optimistic on any kind of plans that we come up with. Because Jesus told us that we can do these things, that doesn't mean he's just going to hand it to us while we sit on our laurels. He's going to say, make a plan and come up with something, just like these people are supposed to do, but I'm going to give it to you because you can do all things through Jesus who strengthens you. So the point I'm trying to make is this. Let's make some plans for the church. We've got leadership class coming up. We've got some ideas in the, in the fall and this spring coming up. We've got some plans to, to excel and to go forward, being positive. We don't want to be like these 10 spies that came back and had a negative attitude. Forget it. No, we're going to go forward. Okay. Mr. Dennis, you now have a song for us. Anybody wants this tomato, you can have it.
356. I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he still stormed Galilee. I believe that he walked on the water. And I believe that he's the answer for me. Yes, I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. And I believe that the tomb was found empty. And I believe that he's the answer for me. I believe in the words of the Bible, how he made the poor blind man to see. I believe that he did his world open, and I believe he made the difference in me. Yes, I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. And I believe that the tomb was found empty. And I believe that he's the answer for me. I believe that he spoke to dead Lazarus. And he said, unbind and set free. I believe that he reigns up in heaven. And I believe that he's the coming again. Yes, I believe in the one that's called Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. And I believe that the tomb was found empty. And I believe that he's the answer for me. All right, well, good evening, Wednesday night class. I'm glad that I have this. In case I wasn't doing too good of a job, I wasn't dodging a few of these or something, so. All right, we will leave that right up here in the front if somebody wants to take that with them to have a nice salad after a while. So uh, we are continuing with our New Testament uh, survey here tonight. Let's do just a brief review of Timothy, 1 Timothy. And then we'll do the bulk of our study in 2 Timothy uh, here tonight. Let's just kind of walk through some of the slides and I'll make a few comments and then we're going to get to chapter 5, hit just a few verses there in chapter 6, then we'll jump into uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1 here tonight. First of all, Paul writing to Timothy tells him in the very beginning of this book, here's why I left you in Ephesus. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. And so if you could summarize that in your own words, 
Why did Paul leave Timothy, this young evangelist, in Ephesus? What was the primary goal? What does he want him to do? Let's stop, stop the false teaching that's going on there. We're going to see that. That's a real theme going through 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. That ought to be a little lesson for us. If all the way back in the first century when the church was just started, they had to be concerned about the possibility of false doctrines taking place, so we too in the 21st century need to be diligent and vigilant to make sure that we are teaching sound doctrine. Literally, in the Greek language, that means healthy doctrine. Healthy Christian doctrine, which will, here's the goal, God's work is building up our faith, not things that are causing controversies and arguments and speculations about things. That's why Paul left him there in Ephesus, a place that he had been for many, many years. All right, also staying in chapter 1, Paul starts kind of talking about his personal experience. And, and here I believe we have a portrait of God, don't we? In chapter 1, verse 13, he said, uh, Paul speaking of himself, said he was a blasphemer, a persecutor of the church, but he obtained mercy. What does that tell me about God and part of the portrait of God? God is a merciful God that he would even forgive somebody like Saul of Tarsus. Well, what else do we learn about God and, and, and Paul? Verse 14, the grace of the Lord was exceedingly abundant for him in Christ. So not only is there a portrait of God that he is merciful, he is a gracious God. But look at this in verse 15. Paul says that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom he is chief. And so not only is God merciful and gracious, he is a saving God. And he would save somebody like Saul of Tarsus, who he said was of himself. I'm the chief of sinners. Verse 16, God used him as a pattern. That means an example to show others that they too can have eternal life if they believe, if they obedient believe, ob obediently believe in Jesus Christ. Paul was a great example of that happening. In chapter 2, we, we find out what was a priority of the church, and that was the priority of prayer. Look at this verse. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Leadership makes a difference no matter where you're at, whether you're in the church, whether you're in the workplace, on a sports team, or even, yes, in a government. Whenever there is unhealthy leadership, the people suffer. And so he says, pray, pray for those leaders, those that are in authority, so that we can live a peaceable and quiet life as we live the Christian life. Also, he emphasizes in chapter 2, there is only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. Then you come into chapter 3, and he starts talks, um, talking about this importance of leadership in the church. He begins with elders. Obviously, there's qualifications for deacons, but let's just focus on the elders for a minute. It talks about their character. They needed to be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate and hospitable. Well, they needed to have some abilities. They needed to have the ability to teach that word of God, which builds our faith. They needed to have a very consistent and healthy home life, one that rules or leads his own house and his children with respect. As well as their Christian experience, they didn't need to be a novice, some kind of new convert, where they could be deceived, they could be overwhelmed with pride. And in a general reputation in the community, they must be well thought of by those outside of the church. And so here, again, leadership makes a difference, especially in the church. So we need to have sound elders. We need to have sound deacons. Now in chapter 6 is where we're going to get to here in just a minute. We'll talk about having the right perspective on finances and on money. But let's go to chapter 5 as he talks about some of the relationships that we should have in the church. 1 Timothy chapter 5. There are several groups that he mentions. He mentions here ought to be our relationship to our older Christian men in the congregation. Look at verse 1. Rebuke not an elder. Talk about an older Christian man. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren. And so when we see some of our older brothers in Christ, we ought to look at to them as a fatherly type figure. And when we see our, 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 our brothers, 
Um, and younger men, see them as brothers, spiritual brothers in Christ. And then how about the older women? That's verse 2. Older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity. I remember when I was a young youth minister and uh, uh, working with our teens, uh, boys and girls, I, I could tell we had a new boy uh, that uh, came into the group and he was kind of sweet on one of the girls there and I thought I'd have a little fun with him. And so as we, he came into class a little early one time, I sat down beside him. I said, I noticed you've been talking with several of the kids and get along well. He's like, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. And I said, I noticed you talked to this one uh, young lady over here. He's like, oh yeah, she's really nice. And I said, by the way, she's my sister. And you and I just need to know this. Up here. He's like, oh, I didn't know that. I was like, well, she's my sister in Christ. But we're going to teach one another. That's how we treat as family. All right, older women as our mothers, older men as our fathers, our younger women as our sisters, and we treat them with all purity, and our older women as our mother-like figures. There's relationships that we have. Now, in those days, they did not have benevolent systems like we have today. They didn't have Social Security. They didn't have Medicaid. They didn't have uh, uh, veterans benefits for those that had served in the military. And so people in the church were going to have needs, especially the widows. And notice, here's some of the things that they would do for their Christian widows. But they needed to kind of be sure that, they, um, that there was a legitimate need and that the family wasn't... Um, shirking their responsibility to take care of what they didn't, needed to. Look, look here in verse uh, number four. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety or their godliness at home and to requite their parents, for that's good and acceptable before God. Now, she that is a widow indeed and desolate, trusteth in God, continuing in its supplication in prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth, and these things give in charge that they may uh, be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he's denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score, um, three score years, that would be 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported for good works, if she had brought up children, if she had lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she's relied, relieved the afflicted, if she has been diligently followed every good work. So if they had widows and the family could care for her, she had family, what was their responsibility? Do what? Let the church take care of her? Huh? Then they need to. He said, if anyone, verse 8, provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel or an unbeliever. And so if you have this Christian relative and you have the means and the ability to help out, you need to do that. Now, there were some widows indeed. They didn't have extended family members. Again, there's not a social network. They couldn't ap apply for different um, financial aid. They were going to starve to death if somebody in the church didn't step up to help out. And so the church would take the initiative, just like you read about in Acts chapter 6, and how that Jerusalem church was helping out their widows. And James writes about pure religion taking care of orphans and who else? Widows. Those are people that in that time weren't able to care for themselves. And so here's some qualifications. They need to be 60 years old and above, and they needed to be very diligent in their Christian service, and the church needed to help them out if they were widows indeed. All right, so that's some of the relationships they needed to have in the church. But then look at verse 17 of how they were supposed to interact with those that were in leadership like the elders. Notice what it says there. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially those who labor in word and doctrine. And so they're, they're teaching the word of God. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy, worthy of his reward or his hire. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, them that sin rebuke before all, that others may also fear. Here's a couple things. With our leadership, how does he say they ought to be treated there? How should you treat an elder, somebody that's a shepherd in the congregation? 
With what? Respect. Honor that they deserve. There's a very serious case that could be made about these folks um, that were giving themselves to the preaching of the word, that these are full-time elders and that they should be even financially supporting them. And I've known uh, some. Well, uh, Steve is an elder in our congregation as well as a minister in our congregation. And so he gets financial support as being an, an evangelist and a shepherd for the congregation. But I've known of some larger congregations that have literally had full-time paid elders. And they did a lot of teaching. They did a lot of counseling and preaching in those congregations. So we're supposed to have this, this honor, this respect for them. And what if somebody makes an accusation against them? You see, when somebody's in a leadership position, for whatever reason, I guess maybe it's because you're the easiest target because you're standing on top of the hill. And so it's easy to lob uh, false accusations against you. And so Paul, writing by the Spirit, tells Timothy, here's what you need to do in a situation where an accusation is made against some of the leaders. What did you need to have? There needed to be some criterion. Now, why is that important? Why have two or three witnesses? That's right. Maybe, yeah, maybe they're making this thing up. Maybe they're just upset about whatever, and now they're saying something negative or, or hurtful to this, this leader. How are they going to defend themselves? But if two or three, you know, every fact will be known by two or three witnesses, that goes all the way back to the Old Testament. And so if there is a legitimate thing that's going on, well, there's witnesses that can, can uh, corroborate that. And then, hey, let's hold them accountable for their actions so that they can change. Because again, leadership has an influence on the congregation. So here's the relationships that they should have with one another, with their brothers and sisters in Christ, older men in the church, older women, and with their leaders. Paul has given him very, very important and vital information that we as a church need to believe and practice as well. Now you come to chapter 6. Chapter 6. And as we kind of finish up uh, just hitting a few of the highlights here in chapter 6, he does talk a little bit about money, but uh, I did want to see yeah, over here in verse number 3. Let's start there. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ into the doctrine which is according to godliness. He's proud, knowing nothing, uh, doting about questions, strifes of words, whereof cometh envy and striving and railing and evil surmisings, perverse, disputing men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Now many of these false teachers were doing what they were doing so that they could get money. Wouldn't that be kind of a surprise to see somebody that's involved in religious activities, church activities, and the only reason that they're doing it is try to fleece people of their money. I'm glad that none of that happens now in the 21st century, right? All right, you saw where I was going with that. All right, but then we come here to chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. So that's kind of in the context is where this is coming from. And then there's also some wealthy Christians. They need to be very generous and responsible with that. But look what verse 9 says. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So money is the root of all evil, yes or no? No. What is the root of all evil according to this verse? The love, the desire. That goes all the way back to the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods and houses and all those things. It is that love of money, that love of materialism that leads people to leave the faith and pierce themselves with many sorrows. So we need to be careful with money. Money is just a tool. Now, all of us probably really, really enjoy electricity on days like this, don't we? 
We've got nice lights. Our computer stuff's all working. My PowerPoint's working by that. Our, our uh, sound system is, is, is uh, being uh, affected by electricity. We have nice air conditioning. It's a great tool. But what if I were to take a screwdriver and try to put it in an outlet? What would happen? Oh, I yowch. That would really hurt me. And so when we use money the, the way that the Lord would have us to do, it's a blessing. It's a gift from God. Um, but if we have this strong desire for money, it can definitely lead us down a wrong path. And so that's 1 Timothy chapter 6. So now let's move into our survey of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy has a total different feel to it. 1 Timothy is kind of upbeat, it's informative, it's, in, it's encouraging. And now we come to 2 Timothy. Now, most of these books don't have an exact date to try to build a figure it out. But most scholars would say, okay, 1 Timothy about 64 AD, and then 2 Timothy about three years later, 67 AD. 67 AD. And they kind of call it Paul's swan song because this would be the last uh, letter that he writes. Have you ever thought about what does that term swan song mean in the English language? Kind of funny little idiom there. A lot of times they'll say it about actors or performers or musicians. This is their swan song. And it kind of comes from folklore that a dying swan sang its best when it was, you know, right at the end of its life. And so that kind of came into the English vernacular. That's kind of where that comes from. And so here's Paul's final letter. You could call it his swan, swan song. And there's a sadness to it a little bit. There's a lot of encouragement there, but there's, there's some heaviness that's, that's taking place. Now, as you look at this, it's a little hard to kind of figure out what's going on because over here, go with me to the book of Acts, chapter 28. Remember when Paul was arrested in Jerusalem, he was taken all the way to Rome, and so he was imprisoned. But it was for fairly comfortable conditions, wasn't it? Look here in, in chapter 28 of the book of Acts. Verse 16, and then we'll jump to the very end of that chapter, uh, 30 and 31. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. Then you come down to verse 30. And Paul dwelt two years in his own hired or his rental, uh, rental house. And he received all that came unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And so, yes, he was arrested. He was, uh, a soldier was with him, but it was like a house arrest. And people could kind of come and go and he can teach. And, and so he had, had a lot of uh, freedom there. Now, as you come to 2 Timothy and you go to chapter 4, he's arrested again. He's a prisoner. He's in bonds. But notice how difficult the situation is that he finds himself in. Go to the very end of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Oh, uh, let's pick it up. How about uh, verse 10? For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark, bring him with thee, for he's profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when uh, thou comest, bring with him and the books, but especially the parchments. So, uh, let me go a little bit further. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. So in Acts chapter 28, we see him under house arrest with quite a bit of freedom there. And when you come to 2 Timothy chapter 4, everybody's pretty much deserted him. Only a few are kind of with him. Timothy's on the way. And they're trying to bring uh, John Mark back with him. Uh, Paul is, is asking, hey, could you bring my cloak? He didn't even have time to grab his big coat. He said, could you bring my parchments? Most scholars believe these were copies of Old Testament scrolls 
that, that Paul would be studying from. So he didn't have time to kind of get his own possessions to grab a coat. He's all by himself. And so most scholars believe this is his second imprisonment, that he got out of the first imprisonment, that he was there in Rome, and then would go and do some more missionary work. He would be rearrested, and it was almost like an urgent arrest, thrown into a prison, and then he would be shortly executed. So his circumstances are a lot different as he pens this inspired letter to Timothy. But let's go here in chapter 1 and see how encouraging Paul is, even under very dire circumstances, as he's writing this swan song of a letter. We pick it up in verse 1, chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of the, thy tears that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that's in thee, which dwelt uh, first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that is in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Okay, so as he introduces himself here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, it's really encouraging, isn't it? How does he feel about Timothy? What's his relationship with Timothy? Uh, my son in the faith. And so Paul is truly modeling, wasn't he, what he was writing to Timothy earlier as we see these younger younger people like our brothers or Paul was kind of a fatherly spiritual figure to him and then he said I remember your tears what does that tell you about Timothy's relationship with Paul he loves him and don't we love our brothers and sisters in Christ and when they're hurting and when there's loss that's taken place like this last week as uh, brother Richard Keeler passed on there's sorrow there's a heaviness amongst all of us. Why is that? Because we're a family. We're forever family. We're a spiritual family. And so we rejoice when good things are happening, when new babies are being born, or people are getting promotions, or people are being baptized into Christ. But then when folks are really going up against it, and it's a hard time, well, Paul and Timothy had that kind of special relationship. He's like a son to me, and he's like a father to me. And, and to see him arrested and persecuted and about to be executed, you know, it obviously would have brought tears to Timothy's eyes. But Paul is an encourager. He said, I've been praying for you night and day, and I want God's grace and his mercy and his peace to be upon you and just to bless you. He is an encourager. And again, he is soon to be executed. He's freezing in this prison. Life would be difficult. You'd think he's, he's singing a song of sour grapes, but that's not what he was doing. He wanted to encourage Timothy. And he talked about, here's the spirit that God has given us. Verse number seven, let's look at this. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. So let's look at that. A spirit of power, love, sound mind, or what do your other versions say on sound mind? Yeah, discipline, self-discipline. Be able to keep your, yourself discipled, under control, and that obviously involves the mind on this. He said, God has given us that spirit. Has God given us a spirit of fear or timidity? No, power, love, sound mind, self-discipline. That's what God has given us, that, that spirit of fear and timidity. That doesn't come from God. That comes from the world. Satan tries to get us to be scared, but he's like, no, God's given us a, a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. Notice uh, Paul in his dire circumstances how, how positive he could be. Verse number 12. For the things which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Now does that sound familiar at all? Have we ever heard that before? It's a song. 
I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able. So that song that we love to sing comes right out of 2 Timothy. And so Paul was saying, I, I know who I've, I've believed in. I trust in him. I trust in Christ. No matter how dark and dire these circumstances are, Christ is going to see me through. Wow, what faith. What a great example of Paul. All right, now we're going to start moving into chapter 2. And he talks about some of the struggles that's going to take place here. So in chapter 2, let's look at verse 3, 4, 5, and 11 through 13. First of all, let's start here in verse 3 of chapter 2. Thou therefore endure uh, hardness or hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if any man strive for masteries, yet he hath not crowned, except he strive lawfully. And then we come down to verses 11 through 13. It's a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, or we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we also shall reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And so you start thinking of what are some things or some occupations that kind of go through difficulty. And he uses one example here. He said we must endure suffering. So as Christians, we're going to go through suffering as a good soldier. How do soldiers suffer? How is it difficult, the life of a soldier? How is that tough? The separation from family and maybe total lack of communication for extremely long periods of time. Very hard on them, hard on the family. How else is it difficult for somebody that's lit in the military? What's that? It's hard. What's, what's hard about it, Dave? Yes, missing the family, or maybe you're on a mission out in the field and you can't have worship services like this. Um, they don't get involved in civilian affairs. Then our next one, don't get entangled with the world. You forget to please your commanding officer there. So who is our commanding officer in, in the church? Is the Lord, right? All right, he's a king of kings, he's the Lord of lords. And so he's telling them, don't get too enmeshed into this world. We want to make sure we're pleasing Jesus. Just like somebody that's in, in, in the military, that they, they made some commitments. They signed up for some things. They got to listen to their, their general or the commander in chief or their, uh, their staff sergeant, you know, that's responsible for them. They've got to please that commanding officer there. And it's a tough life. You think about how difficult it is on the battlefield and how much suffering and sorrow and, and death that they can be exposed to at different times. It's tough. But then thirdly, he makes a comparison of an athlete. We must, uh, must live according to God's rules to receive the crown there. Just like an athlete trains and disciplines themselves. Now, did any of you guys watch the Summer Olympics here that we're on? Ruthie? Yeah, I was amazed with, uh, what's that, is it Katie Ledecky, the swimmer? Is that correct? Is her first name Katie? Um, of how fast and how long she could swim. Like those 1,500 meter things. I mean, it was like 10, 15 minutes of racing. You know, you'd watch it on the TV and it'd go to commercial break and they're still, they're still swimming. But you know, her ability to do that at, she's in her early 20s now, didn't start just a year or two ago. It started when she was a young, young girl. And they would train so many laps every week, like 500 laps when she's five or six years old. Then when she got to be 10 years old, I mean, every week, a 1,000 laps. And then when she got into her early teens, I mean, it was thousands upon thousands of laps that she would swim every single day, every week after week to build up those swimming muscles and to uh, build up her endurance and ability to do that. But she had to do that according to the rules. You can't jump in there too early. You've got to do the flips the right way. You've got to touch 
that, that wall. Otherwise, if you don't and that somebody else touches before you do, you lose. And so we as Christians have to run by the rules. We have to follow what the Lord, our commanding officer, has told us to do. And then verses 11 through 15, if we die to self, Christ will live in us. If we endure for him, he'll reign with us. Even <laughs> when we're not faithful, God is faithful. And isn't that encouraging to think about? Even when we struggle, even when we're kind of blowing it, God is constantly faithful. That's chapter 2. Now, as we continue on here in chapter 2, he gives some really good advice over here in verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that word study in the King James is a little different than what we would understand in English, okay? Traditional English. It should be make an effort, be diligent, do your best, he's telling them, to be a workman that's been proved by God, not needing to be ashamed, but what do you do with the word of truth? What do you say that, that you do with it? You rightly divide. Literally, it means to cut it straight. Just like I was cutting on a pattern or if I was trying to cut a board on my circular saw, I'd want to cut that thing just totally straight. And so that's what we need to do with the Word of God. Now, if you go back to chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, he says, uh, verse 13 and 14, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. The good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. And so he told him, I want you to hold fast these words, these apostolic words that Paul has passed on to him. They're Jesus' words, so hold on to them. Cut them straight. Live them out. Jesus would say, you know, anyone who holds to my teachings... He is really my disciples. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Because here's the danger. If we aren't cutting it straight, if we're not holding to that pattern, if we're not trusting in the ministry of the Holy Spirit that helps us to keep that faith. Because remember, our faith cometh by hearing the Word of God. The Word of God builds us up. It is sound. It is healthy for us. Because here's what can happen. Here's what they were having to face there in Ephesus. Verse 16, he says, But shun profane and vain, that would be worthless babblings, for they'll increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as does a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. So here Paul was saying, you hold to that teaching, you cut it straight, because there's some that aren't. And he even mentions a couple of them that they would be familiar with. People like Hymenaeus and Philetus. And what were they teaching? They were saying that the resurrection has already passed. And so imagine you're a new Christian. You mean we miss Jesus' resurrection, or the massive resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous? Man, what's the hope for us? I mean, it was ruining the faith of people. So they needed those teachers, they needed those elders, they needed those deacons and those evangelists to teach the word of God in its wholeness and to cut it straight so that they wouldn't be misled on all this false teaching that was going on. And that's what Paul had warned them about, the Ephesian elders saying, this is going to happen, and now we're seeing it manifested 10 years uh, later there. All right? So now we go on over here. Um, to chapter number three, saying here's how things are going to get worse in the future. This know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitor, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So he says here in chapter 3 
that in the last days, things are going to get worse. Now the question is, when do the last days happen? Are they happening right now? What do you think? This is a Bible class. Are we in the last days? Yes, Don says possible. Well, why do you think we're in the last days? Somewhere, I believe, somewhere in the Bible, it speaks of they're in the last days. We'll be having a lot of wars around the world and things of that nature. All right. So Don was saying, you know, kind of some of the things Jesus talked about, you know, that there'd be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and all that kind of stuff, kind of feel like, you know, seeing some of those things taking place might be an indication of the last days. All right. Did I see another hand that came up. Last days, Brother Qual. I think Hebrews 51 is one. Good, good. Read that, please. All right. So he said we are basically in the last days when? Right now. All right, in these last days. He's spoken through us through his son. So think of this. Let me give you a visual aid here. So uh, we had the patriarchal age or era. Time from Adam. All right. All the way to the time of Moses. Patriarchal. <laughs> Then the Mosaic Age, or era, up to the time of Christ. And now we are in that Christian Age, or era, till he comes again in the second coming. And that is considered throughout the New Testament. You see many uh, references being in the last days. Okay, And so as Paul was reading there from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, we are in the last days, but in the course of those last days, things are going to get worse. As he describes, he said, in these last days, things are going to get worse. Evil is going to proliferate. Now, here's a test for you. What book did we talk about not too long ago, just a few weeks ago, before Jesus comes again, that there was going to be a proliferation of evil? Evil was going to grow worse and worse. Do you remember that? What book was that? Not First Timothy. 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, okay? Here were two signs that Paul tells them you need to be looking up. Number one, there's going to be a falling away. There's going to be apostasy. And secondly, there would be a revelation of the man of sin. And again, we encourage you, do your own study. Is that an individual? Or is that just kind of a personification of evil growing in these last days before Jesus comes again? And so we need to be looking out and say, hey, are things getting better or getting worse? You know, we always need to be prepared, but that might be something to, to consider and really think about. But Paul told Timothy, in the last days, evil was going to continue to grow and abound. All right, also in chapter 3, we see the importance of the scriptures here and their inspiration. Look with me here in chapter 3 and verse 16. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So let's look at this here. Uh, oh, that was all of those different descriptors there. All right, so the Word of God is profitable for doctrine. That means teaching. Secondly, reproof is rebuke. That means a strong, strong correction. Thirdly, correction. We know somebody's going the wrong direction. The Word of God will correct us. And guidance, instruction into righteousness so that we can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, how much of Scripture is good for those things? Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and guiding us. How much of it is? All of it. Just the New Testament, right? Old Testament and New Testament because, look here in verse, what, 15? And that from a child, speaking to Timothy, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, 
which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. What Bible did Timothy have in the first century? I'd be the Old Testament, wouldn't it? All right? And so he had been taught those things since he was just a child. Where did he get that? Who was teaching him all these scriptures? His grandmother and his mother. They had great faith, and they, they modeled, they taught, they read that. And uh, ladies over here, how early should we start working with our kids, kind of teaching them some of the Bible things? Day one. I love that. Yes, that's true. And it's amazing what kids know and understand even before they can audibly say it and all. Because I remember uh, when our kids were little, we took them to a little Bible class. They were like one year old. And we're like, yeah, should we be dropping them off? You're always so worried about that first one. You know, are they going to get much out of it? And those kids come back seeing these things or saying things about it. You're like, wow, it is amazing how much they're, they're learning. Okay, so let's start early on teaching them the word of God to make us thoroughly equipped for every good work. All right, let's continue on here. All right, he tells them in chapter 4, here's some things that uh, he wanted him to do, to be involved in. From chapter 4, starting, uh, start with me in verse 2. He says, I want you to preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch then in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And so he tells them, preach the word. You need to do some reproving and correcting along the way. Rebuke, that would be a condemnation of sin. Exhort, that's an encouragement of them. And then he said, I want you to watch for all things. Be alert. Do the work of an evangelist because there's always that tendency to get what kind of teacher that will do something with your ear. Oh, what does he mean by, Mary, tickling your ear? That they'll heap up these teachers that tickle their ear. Tell them what they want to hear. Tell them just the positive messages. Only the encouraging message. Don't talk about sin. Don't talk about judgment. Don't talk about hell. Any kind of negative stuff. And I've known of some, literally, ministers, large congregations that they were instructed not to teach about certain things. Not to teach the whole counsel of the Word of God. But Paul, Paul told him, hey, you be an evangelist. And you do these things. Do encourage but you also need to rep reprove and to rebuke. And that's part of being in a forever spiritual family where you only want the very best for one another. Then finally, we need to end on this here tonight. As we close up our study of 2 Timothy, look what Paul felt about his life as he'd come to the end of his journey. Verse 6, For I know I'm ready to be offered in the time of my departures at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not only to me, but unto all them that also love his appearing. So Paul said, I fought the good fight. I've run the race. My time of departure has come. It's come to an end. History says that he was uh, beheaded um, there in Rome uh, around AD 67. But Paul wasn't afraid. He knew that his journey was going on. And it's sad to see, you know, that, that word departure means like an army that's packing up its tents and it's going on another campaign. Or it could be used like a ship that's, that's leaving out of the port and heading off on another destination. It looks sad as they're walking out or they're sailing off. But imagine if you're on the other side. What does it look like when that ship is starting to come in? Oh, it's going to be sad for Timothy and John Mark and Priscilla and Aquila that Paul's heading off on another journey. But imagine the heavenly reception that he has as his ship starts coming in to its forever, forever home to dock and be with the Lord forever and ever. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for this great privilege to study your word. Father, I, I pray that we would take heart uh, many of the lessons that we've talked about here tonight, the importance of of knowing your word and applying it to our life and, and being good students and, and good uh, folks that, that 
uh, are applicators of it, that we try to live it out, and we ask for your forgiveness and your grace and mercy as, uh, as we struggle in this journey. We thank you for great examples like Paul that maintained his faith to the very end and such an inspiration for so many of us here today. We are touched by his, his writings. Father, I pray that we can be good mentors, good examples uh, to uh, one another, and Father, that we truly would see each other as, as brothers and sisters in the same forever family and truly love and encourage and build one another up. Thank you once again for this midweek service where we can come together and to encourage one another. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, we are dismissed tonight. We thank you all for being here and thank for those that joined us by class uh, via online tonight as well. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. And he Once was, I once was, once was.